call the Education K-12 Subcommittee to order. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Representatives Carringer, Cassida, Here. Clemens, Here. Hurt, Here. Love, Here. Chairman Sapicki, Here. Chairman Reagan, Here. Chairman White, Here. Chairman Haston. Here. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Any personal orders before we begin? Seeing none, we will uh, go, be going slightly out of order. Uh, Chairman Reagan uh, needs to get to a health committee here, so we're going to be taking up item number two, okay. House Bill 1266. Okay. Properly motion. you have an amendment? Yes, sir. The amendment drafting code is 4248, and it rewrites the bill. All right. Do I have a motion? Motion. Properly motioned. Uh, we will go ahead and, uh, without objection, vote on adopting this amendment. Uh, all those in favor of Amendment 4248, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Ayes have it. We are back on the bill as amended. Chairman Reagan, you are recognized on House Bill 1266. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, uh, this bill addresses a problem in current law on workers' compensation uh, related issues. When it comes to LEA personnel, uh, our law is unclear and is challenging to implement, especially for districts that do not have workers' comp insur compensation insurance. That is to say, they're self-insured. <clears throat> this amendment that makes the bill we just put on there basically does three things. It clarifies what is required of an LEA that does not have workers' compensation coverage, in other words, is self-insured, and when it comes, and what it must do when it comes to an injury on the job. It clarifies the law by deleting the language, it shall be the same uh, as LEA if the workers' compensation and substitutes the language, the LEA must comply with the personal injury rules of the State Board of Education. Personal injury rules uh, for the Department of Education and the State Board give minimum requirements of what an LEA must, be, must provide for personal injury uh, and personal injury leave, I'm sure, sorry, for a teacher and dictates that the LEA must create a policy to address this. It also clarifies what full benefits are, that is to say those benefits that the LEA provided and the employees opted into at the time the leave begins. And it ensures that a teacher will continue to be provided, continue to be provided the same benefits as before the injury. Finally, it makes it clear that the benefits are the same as if the LEA had workers' compensation uh, that could be provided for up to one year. Section D in the bill is simply a restatement of what is currently in the law. With that explanation, I stand ready to answer questions. Thank you, Chairman Reagan. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Representative Clemens, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Reagan, can you tell me the difference between the benefits as if they had had workers' compensation as opposed to the personal injury rules of the State Board of Education? Chairman Reagan? I'm not sure I understood your question. So in Section 1 is what I'm asking about. It, we're changing the language, shall be the same if the, as if the LEA had workers' compensation. Yes. What are the benefit differences between that a teacher would get as a result of that language as opposed to the language that they would get under the personal injury rules of the state board. Chairman Reagan? If I understood your question correctly, and I, I, I may, may still have misunderstood, essentially what this is saying, that LEAs that ha are self-insured may have different benefit packages. This is saying that they must have the same as if they had workers' comp insurance, which all those that are not self-insured have. Did, did I answer your question? Representative Clemens? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're trying to, I'm probably asking it poorly. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what the difference in benefits to the teachers are under those two phrases uh, under, a, a, as currently worded. But I think, I think you have answered the question. Thank you, sir. Any other questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we will be voting on House Bill 1266. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Ayes have it on the full education. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Committee. That brings us back to item number one on the calendar. Uh, House Bill 1288 by Representative Johnson. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Properly motion. Uh, Representative Johnson, you are recognized Second. on House Bill 1288. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here we go. Okay, so, so what this bill does, um, research shows us that removing uh, students does little to create a more peaceful environment or safer schools. Students removed from the classroom are more likely to drop out of school, more likely to end up in the juvenile justice system. So what this bill does is it focuses on revising school discipline policies to reduce the emphasis on exclusionary practices. 
It focuses on school discipline policies that can be tailored to the specific needs of that community, and it reduces inequalities in educational opportunities. It also makes our schools safer and reduces the amount of misbehavior, and that is due to natural consequences that make the student who is misbehaving take a look at the reasons for their behavior, who it affected, and that they have to, to um, address that specifically. So it gives an accountability and a responsibility for the misbehavior that other actions don't. And a perfect example of that is something that we've done in schools for a long time, and I've never gotten it, but where you have a kid, a student who's cutting class, laying out of class. You know, I taught high school for much of my career, and you have kids laying out of class, and then they suspend them. And it's like, holy cow, you know, what do we, they're, they're trying to remove themselves from class, and so we remove them. We actually give them more of what they were asking for. So um, talking about more natural consequences for that addresses the behavior, who it hurts. And so for me, you know, if you have a student who's laying out of class, the best thing to do is more time, making up the time that they lost when they were out of class. Um, but it focuses on the specific misbehavior, ensures the student understands who and how the misbehavior affects so that they take responsibility and accountability for their actions. And so the best way to reduce misbehavior is to make stu sure that students have meaningful consequences that specifically address that behavior. And that's also how we reduce the occurrences. Traditional discipline measures are general, generally ineffective at altering the behaviors. And so that's really what we're trying to do. And um, the, the importance of keeping the data is so that as schools, it, it allows them to sort of to, to address the type of program that works in their school. And we, we keep data and research on that. So other schools who maybe aren't doing as well as some can share what they've learned, share those experiences and learn from each other so that we can all do better. But, but you know, misbehavior, kids want to please. I don't care if they're kindergarten or they're high school. They want to please adults. And if they're misbehaving, there's a reason. That reason of acting out or trying to avoid an activity generally comes from needing, trying attention, trying to get people to understand what's going on with them. With ACEs, you know, the kids I taught were overloaded with ACEs. And if you address that with the, with traditional discipline that pushes those kids further away and gives them more stress. And, and so it's, it's about helping the child understand the misbehavior, but also helping the adults understand that. So you can address it without increasing the stress, but making that child understand how even, even something like acting out in class, you know, you're trying to avoid the situation. Maybe you don't understand the task, you'd rather be seen as acting out than as being dumb. And so that tri child is trying to let you know that they can't do that activity. And I think it's just critical that we start looking at those behaviors and making sure that kids are taking accountability and responsibility so that we reduce the behavior so that schools are safer. Thank you for that uh, explanation. Uh, Chairman Watt, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Johnson, I agree with what you're saying about the ACE part and everything, and, and I understand the concept. My question is this. Uh, we have passed a bill where we, we, we dealt with this last year and then this year where we put in the Teacher Discipline Act where we go through a step-by-step -step process to help our teachers. And so we kind of have that already going in place. I'd kind of like to see us see how that it works. If, if we were to pass a bill like this, I don't know if there would be a conflicting issue, of course, one bill overrides the other. I understand that. But um, any thoughts on that? I just kind of feel like we've got one bill in place where we're addressing this. Is it really necessary to, uh, even though I understand the concept, what you're trying to do? Representative Johnson? Yeah, um, well, you know, as someone who's been in that classroom for 27 years and, and actually specifically worked with uh, emotionally disturbed behavior disorder kids, and I can tell you, using these practices, in a year, I might have sent three kids to the office. 
And literally, my, my kids were in the last spot they could be in an actual public school because they had been in trouble so many times. This works. The other one is traditional. It doesn't address that responsibility and accountability piece. And, and we see less misbehavior. We also don't see the level of inequalities we do with um, students of color and disabled students who are typically, under the old model, suspended at, at two, three, and four times the rate. So it's just a different approach. The other one is the traditional approach, and I honestly don't think it's gonna change much from what we've been doing. Thank you. Chairman Sapicki, you're recognized. Th thank you very much, and I, I do appreciate your opinion. Um, it's your opinion. Um, in the discipline bill, there were parts of the bill that broke down where the LEA was going to have to promulgate uh, necessary steps and procedures for their teachers and principals to take. Uh, we are working on the mental health bill that kind of coincides with that to give a well-rounded approach to all aspects of the student's education. Um, I do agree with my colleague here that maybe it's too soon for something like this. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to send us to General Sub. Properly motioned. We have two objections. Need I think we need three to override that. So without objection, we will be sending 1288. Was it to Summer Study? Uh, House Bill 1288 to General Sub. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and thank, members. Thank you, Representative Johnson. That brings us to. We're actually going to go over to uh, item number five, uh, House Bill 1501 uh, by Representative uh, Cochran. Properly motioned. We do have, uh, we've got a little housekeeping to do on this, so bear with me uh, as I try to make sure I don't make any mistakes here. We do have an untimely filed amendment on this, if I'm correct. Uh, what is the drafting code that you have on that? Mr. Chairman, the code is 006346. 63346. Is that what we've got? Okay. Um, so, without objection, we will be voting to consider um, this untimely filed amendment 6346. Um, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. Um, we now need a motion on the amendment. Second. Properly motioned. You are recognized uh, on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the, the amendment makes the bill. Um, and essentially, this is kind of a... Uh, let me, hold on. Let me sorry. stop, you, let me stop yes. you right there real quick. Mm -hmm. Since it does make the bill, without objection, let's go ahead and vote on adopting this amendment. And then I do think we have one more thing we need to do, and then we'll get on the bill with sure. it being clean. So we'll be voting on uh, adopting amendment 6346. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. We are back on the bill as amended. Now, we do have a verbal amendment, uh, a correction that legal called a drafting error, and I will need a motion and a second to uh, consider this uh, verbal amendment. Motion. Second. Properly motion. All right. Uh, you have it. I'll, I'll, I'm going to go out of session for a second and let legal explain this uh, verbal amendment. Out of session. Katie Robertson, Legal Services. On page 8, subdivision C1, that's a list, one and two, so and, the word and should be added to the end of subdivision C1. All right, you've heard the explanation of the verbal amendment. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of adopting this, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no, ayes have it. All right, we're gonna roll those, I need to, we roll that into one. We're gonna roll that into one amendment and we are back on the bill as amended. House Bill 1501, Representative Cochran, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was easy enough. Um, th this is a really kind of a, a new way to, to look at those schools that are at risk to, in, in to go into the Achievement School District. These are not, this is not addressed schools that are in the Achievement School District, but those Tier 2 schools um, that are kind of right there on the cusp. And so it's the School Turnaround Pilot Program um, where basically 10 schools uh, in that tier two uh, would be selected. Um, there's local buy-in, and essentially the, the, the big difference between this and the ASD, um, this, the state does not come in and take over uh, a school. What, what happens is there's, there's 
some funding provided um, for, for training, and actually it's uh, a, a contracted company comes in and, and trains teachers, but, the, but there's local buy-in. There's actually a, a turnaround committee that involves, um, or that, excuse me, that includes uh, local teachers, uh, local school board representatives, um, and, and like I say, the, the local LEA maintains control uh, of the school, but basically this is, it's a, it's, it's a pilot program um, and, and essentially could, could maybe show an alternative to the Achievement School District. I, I, I think there, I, I think we, it, it could be pretty safe to say there have been mixed results on those. Um, and, and so that this is a new way to, to, to look at turning around some schools. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, Chairman White, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Committee. And let me uh, support and back up Representative Cochran in this. We met, this bill uh, became involved with it last summer, really. And it really, it, it's a uh, five-year pilot intervention program that we'll see if, if it works, a school turnaround. One thing that they we want, and we're, we move at the speed of light around here, as I always say, and so we. this is why we had to go through this maneuver to get this back on, because we weren't real sure that this was being carried. Uh, but uh, we are carrying this, and Senator Hale is, is kind of the mastermind behind it. But uh, to intervene, what, one thing we want to do is keep schools out of the ASD, and if we can work with districts where you have schools that are in Tier 2 in danger of possibly moving into the ASD, this is a pilot program to work with these schools over the coming years. And that, that's the gist of what's trying to, uh, to uh, happen uh, on this particular bill. And it, you'll have a, um, a MOU between the LEA and the turnaround experts and, and DOE selects in cooperation with a local committee. Does that, does that sound right? Uh, I, yes, I, I believe that's a very accurate uh, description. I think one other important thing to point out, there are numerous companies that provide these type of turnaround services, and so we would obviously be making sure that this is not written in a way that benefits one company over another. Any other questions? Uh, Representative Clemens, you're recognized. Yeah, how many companies do this? I, I can find out that answer. I can find, I, and, I, and I don't know, but I just, I know that there, there, are, there are several, so, um, but I can find out that for you and, get, and get, you, get you that information. And so how will this differ from the ASD? Representative uh, Shocker? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The big difference is that the local LEA maintains control of their school. Um, whereas in the ASD, the school is taken over essentially by the state. The state can come in and hire new principals, hire new teachers. None of that occurs uh, with this program. The LEA maintains control. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, if the LEA wants to keep those principals and teachers in place, they can do that. But it's a program where um, basically these turnaround experts, they provide training. Um, there's funding provided by the state. Um, to pay for that training and to, and to pay for this contract. Another, I think, an important thing and a big difference is this is a pay for performance. So essentially, you would determine on the front end of the contract, the school is here, we want it here. At the end of that five years, if it's not here, you're not getting the full amount of, your con uh, the full amount of that contract payment. So, so that, that, that's another big difference is we're, kind of ho we're holding this, count this company accountable for the results that they produce. Representative Clemens. So a school is going to be beholden to the instruction and guidance of a private company that contracts with the Department of Education. Representative Cochran. The, a, a private organization would come in and provide training uh, for that school um, if they are selected for the pilot program. Um, and then, like I say, th there's also a local, if you'll turn to page four, um, there's a school turnaround committee, um, and, and that, that committee makes recommendations concerning the entire turnaround plan. And so that, that committee consists of a local school board member, um, the principal of the school, parents from the school, teachers from the school. Um, and these people are, are appointed by the Board of Education, by the, by the director of school. So there's about 100% more local buy-in with this program than there is the ASD. And that, that, that's the big distinction, is the ASD takes away local control. Representative Clemens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and I mean, I think the ASD is terrible. Yeah. Uh, it's a failure. Yeah. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I, I just have concerns here about the State Department and its contracting ability, choosing a vendor, and then assigning that vendor to a school or an LEA 
and that school or LEA having no say in this private company that mm -hmm. the Department of Ed has chosen on high and creating an issue there um, where they're bound by what that private company is telling them or coaching them or however, um, that, that seems like it would create some issues, e even with the local buy-in, which sounds great. Um, I just think this whole model of sending somebody in to do trained teachers and administrators' jobs for them mm -hmm. is, is, is getting problematic. Uh, we continue no. to go down this path, so I, uh, that's my concern. Okay, thank you. Representative Love, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have, I have some concerns also. I have a few priority schools in my district, and I'm going to agree with my colleague from, from Davidson County. Uh, the Achievement School District has, has not been very successful in helping those schools get out of priority status. If I'm not mistaken, the option of having your own turnaround plan was always there, but you had to develop that. And I think in the last iteration of proposals, there was even uh, thought about having different tiers of schools and ways to get out. I think this probably incorporates part of that. My concern and question is, what happens to the school if at the end of five years, they are not ready to come off of this, this list and this contracted company has not gotten their their payment. Do they now go into the ASD? No, I, 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 at that point, I don't. It's it's not an automatic um, designation to the ASD. I, I'm sure at that point the um, the department can look at, at the school's performance and determine whether or not it should. But no, I, it's not. It's certainly, if they did not improve at the end of the five years, it's not an automatic designation to the ASD. Okay. Representative Love? I think, and my concern is that, again, having had at one time about four priority schools in my district, a high school and, and elementary school, my, my con and then some got off priority list uh, where the, the principal was innovative, the community was involved, and they put together their own turnaround plan and, and did this. And some funds were provided, I think, from the state to do this turnaround, and I think even uh, Shelby County has a model where they had schools in their uh, improvement zone that outperformed the ASD. And so I do have concerns about having a private company that from a list that's provided, mm -hmm. uh, that's not generated by local organizations, but provided by the state, generated by the state. Uh, I have questions and concerns about that. Secondly, I have questions and concerns about the fact that if a school does not get off the priority list at that moment, they may perpetually be in this cycle of being on a priority list, this company getting paid just to have this contract, even though it's a pilot, right? Mm -hmm. That it may get, yeah. get a, a contract signed again. And then what we have then is a situation where uh, the next generation of kids coming through that school end up being um, the ones who are stuck in this vicious cycle. Right. Representative Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and again, I think one of the safeguards uh, in this system is that the company, I mean, because you'd mentioned, you know, does the company just continue to get paid even if they're not making progress? And I think that's, that, that's maybe one of the innovative parts of, of, uh, of this program is that the company does not get paid unless they, they meet those, those benchmarks. And so there's kind of that incentive there. Um, also, you know, again, it's my understanding that the idea is it's not that they just come in, train you with a few in services and leave, but they actually are coming in to, to equip teachers, to equip the administration to be able to do this once they've gone. I, it's, it's, it's designed in a way that it's not meant to be permanent. It's that they kind of come in, show you diff a different type of way to do things. I guess, it, again, kind of provides some, a, a unique skill set there. And, and teach you how to maintain that after after they have left. Um, and, and again, with the ultimate goal being to keep them off that ASD list, which I, again, I think we kind of all agree has not had the results that we wanted. Representative Cassidy. Uh, Chairman, Chairman White, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. I was just going to, to address that, well, I think we got off a little bit off the point about the pilot 
the uh, the private company or anything. Basically, this is a five-year pilot program to see if this kind of intervention may work. Uh, currently, for those who you know have disappointments with the ASD, if the state if a if a school goes into the ASD, it's most likely the turnaround is a charter model. And so this would possibly this what this does if you look on page four, the school turnaround committee is composed of the local school principal, the local school board member of that area, three parents of the school, two teachers of the school, working all in unison to see if we can find a model to where we can help the school stay out of that priority status. Uh, if it doesn't work after five years, that's what the whole point is. It's a pilot program to see if this, this would work. Uh, nothing happens. The school just continues to operate like it always has. It doesn't, it, it wasn't ever taken out of anything. It's just a pilot program f f to see if the school turnaround philosophy may work. And I believe the representative that. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And just and to address, if Chairman, if I, if I may. Yeah, Representative Cochran. Um, just to address one, others, one, one other uh, question that was asked earlier, the state doesn't choose the company for the local LEA. So there, there, there will be a list of companies that are approved based on certain criteria. And it's the, actually the, it's the local LEA that, con, that chooses um, from those vendors um, and, and contracts with it. So it's not, it's not a mandate from on high that you will go with this company. That local LEA looks at that list, and then they actually contract with the company. So again, just more, more local buy-in. Representative Cassidy. Mr. Chairman, I have no previous question. Previous question has been called. Seeing no objections, we'll be I, voting. I had an objection, but I guess it, is it still three or <laughs> what two do? Yeah, still three. Uh, <laughs> without <laughs> without objection, more. without three objections, uh, we'll be voting on House Bill uh, 1501. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. All those opposed say no. no. I have it on the full education. All right, we're going to take up item number one on the addendum calendar before we come back to uh, a couple of mine on the regular. Um, we'll be on House Bill, House Bill 1591. Um, Hold on one second. All right, we are going to be on House Bill 1591. Members, the only motion in order at this time is a motion to reconsider. Is there a motion to reconsider by a member who voted on the prevailing side? Uh, Representative Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that we reconsider our action on House Bill 1591. You have heard the motion. Do I have a second? second. Properly seconded. Uh, all those in favor of reconsidering our action on House Bill 1591, please say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Eyes have it. Uh, we have reconsidered our action, and we are on House Bill 1591. Chairman White, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee, and we appreciate that. This is another bill that, as we're getting to the end here, we uh, want to bring back up. We oh, work. I, sorry, Chairman White. Do yes, I have sir. a motion and a second on the bill? Properly motion. Chairman White, you are recognized. Okay. What HB 1591 does, and. Uh, and I'll explain this. Basically, when we, back in January, we did a special session. We did the third grade retention. Uh, and the, what this particular uh, bill says is that in the, it clarifies that the parent or the guardian of a student is the party with the right to appeal that decision to the Department of Education. We all believe that the parent has the ultimate responsibility to provide for their child's education. And this particular bill gives the parent or the guardian the right to make that appeal if the child is recommended for third grade retention and they are in the approaching category. And then the second part of the bill, it just says that a parent is to be informed, and this is the part I really like about the bill, the parent is to be informed once a determination is known if the child's reading is reading in, in a deficient level. Uh, three points of that. 
Immediately upon determining that a student in kindergarten through grade three has a significant reading deficiency based on the results of the universal reading screener, most recently administered by, to the student, the LEA or the public charter school must notify the student's parent in writing that the student has been identified to have a significant reading deficiency and provide the student's parents with, number one, information about the importance of a student being able to read proficiently at the end of third grade, Number two, reading intervention activities that the parent may use with a parent student at home to improve reading proficiency. And then third, information about the specific reading interventions and supports that the LEA or public charter school recommends for the student. So number one, give the parent as much notification early that the child needs intervention. But when it comes to third grade retention, the appeal process will rest with, with, with the parent or, or will be the option for the parent to, to appeal that to the uh, Department of Education. And that's the gist of what the bill does. And I have made a, a, a promise to, uh, since we have went through this, we don't want to open up a can of worms again. I have made a commitment to the Department of Education and everyone that went through the special session that this bill will, will continue to move clean as it is. If it's amended any way, it will be pulled. Uh, but so we are, or if it's, yeah, if it's amended any way, we won't move forward with it. But with that, Mr. Chairman, I renewed the motion on the bill. Thank you for that explanation. Does anybody have any questions on the bill? Uh, Representative Clemens, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, one question. So we're requiring this to be filed by the student's parent or guardian, um, but we defer to our teachers to assign letter grades and determine how well students are doing um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So if a student happens to test poorly, but the teacher feels like that student is doing well enough to move forward, do we not want the teacher to also be able to appeal? Chairman Watt. Good question. The way I understand this, when we passed the original retention bill, I don't think we put in place exactly the, the, appeal, the, the appeal part as far as who and this just gives the parents that right. Now I think the teacher would be have have the say so also, also. But this is this just puts the parent in the equation also. Representative Clemens. Yeah, I mean, I obviously like that. Um, I didn't support the original legislation, um, but the appeals part is is crucial. Um, I remember that being in the original bill. I don't know that the details of it were in there, like you said. But I, I have concerns about a teacher not having a say there because sometimes students parent or guardian um, might not have the full picture and I mean while they're always acting in the best interest of the child hopefully um, and in most cases they are I assume um, not having that teacher opportunity is is concerning me so that's it that, that's it thanks Mr. Chairman thank you any other questions for the sponsor Chairman Watt uh, th thank you, and, and if, if it's the will of the committee to move on, we'll make sure we have clarification on that. But I think one thing good about this bill, the section two, is if the teacher is communicating with the parents all the way from kindergarten, then the parent knows and the teacher knows as they move move through. And that I think that will be they're all they're working together. That's the part I really like about the bill is is that don't wait to third grade to let. Your, the parent know that the child is not reading proficiently and they're going to be retained. That's detrimental to the whole system. Any other questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we'll be voting on House Bill 1591. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Ayes have it <coughs> on the full education. Committee, we're now on item number three, House Bill 865 by Chairman Haston. Chairman Haston, you are recognized. I don't see an amendment on your bill. Is that uh, correct? No, no, thank you. No, it is not. Um, okay, you're, you're recognized on 865. 
Do I have a motion? Motion. You have a motion and a second. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in the past couple of years, we have all become familiar with the fact that uh, percentage increases in the BEP instructional component does not guarantee pay raises going directly to our teachers. Um, what this bill does is help guarantee that these uh, BEP instructional component increases reach the teachers that need it the most by having the state salary schedule, uh, the state salary schedule match the BEP instructional component percentage increase. Uh, in other words, uh, the set teacher salary minimum would raise that same percentage as has been increased in the BEP. Uh, for example, if the General Assembly passes a 3% increase in the BEP instructional component, then the state minimum for teacher salaries would also increase by that same percentage, ensuring that the lowest paid teachers who are at the state minimum will see that 3% increase. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Okay, committee, with that explanation on 865, further discussion? Questions the question has been called. Do I have an objection to the question? Hearing none. All those in favor of moving House Bill 865 out to full committee, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Moves out. Chairman Haston. Let's go to item number four House Bill 1407. You do have an amendment traveling. Do you want to entertain the amendment? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, do I have a motion and a second? You it's motion, uh, drafting numbers uh, 6141. Okay, Amendment 6141. It rewrites the bill. Would you like to add that to the bill before we have discussion? Uh, yes. Okay, members, any objection to adding 6141 to House Bill 1407? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. You're now back on the bill as properly amended. Chairman? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, I didn't realize when I filed this bill that it was going to be a job creation bill. Um, <laughs> with the amount of lobbyists that have come to my office against this bill, they've had to hire all kinds of staff to keep up with the meeting schedule. And, uh, and so we'll address that a little, bit, a little bit later. But all this bill is, as it stands right now with this amendment, is just a recommendation bill. It was uh, to ask 13 you know, people much smarter than me come together and uh, including uh, a teacher, a parent of a K-12 student, commissioner, uh, the state board. There, there was 13 different members uh, to basically come together and talk about the teacher evaluation process and talk about what works, what doesn't work, and then make some recommendations. And that's it. And just wanted to see, they may come back and say, the evaluation process is great, don't change anything. Great. Um, that's that's what this, the intent of this bill was, was just to get some ideas. And uh, it uh, obviously uh, did not go over well with uh, almost everybody, it, it seemed like. Uh, you know, and I, f I finally just had to say, you know, we'll just uh, table this and uh, we'll actually roll this to next year's calendar if, uh, if it'd be the will of the committee. Uh, but with that being said, I entertain that motion if anybody would like to make it. We have a motion to roll this to next year by the Representative Haston. Any objection? There's been a second. Motion to second. Any objection? Okay, without that, all those um, House Bill 1407 is ruled to uh, move to next year. Thank you. I believe that brings us to the special calendar correct um, that brings us to the special calendar of item number one on the special calendar is house bill 46 which uh, will be going back to the clerk's desk uh, without objection house bill 46 is going back to the clerk's desk and with that the committee is cl uh, any other anything else to say uh, committee is closed subject to the call of the chair we're adjourned